Welcome back everyone. I have a whale of a video for you today. I mean, it's a monster. It's a difficult topic, as deep as an ocean, but I'm confident that we can navigate these complex waters together. And I think if you watch the whole video, you'll find that it will actually be a lot of pun. Chapter 68 of the Quran begins with noon by the pen and what they write. The study Quran says noon is also an Arabic word for fish. Some commentators thus relate it to an old Arab myth that holds that the earth is upon the back of a mythical fish. Then several commentators are named. Note two things about this quote. They call the myth of the earth on the back of a fish an Arab myth. Second, for those with sufficient background information about this myth, which you will all have after this video, this comment seems conspicuously brief. It's almost as if these study Quran scholars didn't want to tell you much about what former Muslim authorities actually believed. The first problem with that quote is that the study Quran commentators are calling this an Arab myth. Now, they're doing that either out of their own ignorance or an attempt to conceal the fact that this Arab myth is actually related to a Jewish myth, well attested in many pre-Islamic Jewish sources. Yeah, it looks like borrowing again. Second, it's not just a few Muslim authorities who believed this, though the study Quran only names four. In a recent excellent post on the Islam Issue blog, Blackjack, who you see in the comment section on this channel, gives us many examples of this myth in Islamic sources. The Prophet was asked about the earth. Where is it? He said, on the water, and the water is on a rock, and the rock is on the back of a whale, the two ends of which meet the throne. It was said, have you seen the whale? Where is it? He said, on the shoulders of an angel, his feet in the wind. Here's another. Muhammad said that the distance between two earths is a march of 500 years. They're on the back of a whale whose two ends meet in heaven. And the whale is on a rock and the rock in the hands of an angel. And here is one of my personal favorites. Ibn Abbas said the earth is on a noon and the noon is on the sea and the sea is on a rock and the rock is on a bull. And the bull is on soil and no one knows what's under the soil except for Allah. I love how Ibn Abbas so carefully limits his speculation. Some of you are aware of that old jingle. There's a fleck on the speck, on the tail, on the frog, on the bump, on the branch, on the log, in the hole of the bottom of the sea. That was not Ibn Abbas. That would just be crazy. The earth on the whale, on the rock, on the horn of the bull was Ibn Abbas. That makes much more sense. And yes, Muslims, we know all hadith that are gross or embarrassing or stupid are weak and they should all be rejected. Yeah, heard that before. And so it's no surprise that such comments are already appearing on the blog and they will no doubt begin appearing on this video in short order. Welcome to Islam, where Muslims defend their religion by arguing their own sources are unreliable. Fortunately, Blackjack has included lots of biographical information for the narrators, so you can look at all that and judge for yourselves. We're not going to talk much more about the Muslim sources in this video. We're going to talk about background and context. So let's jump to the end of Blackjack's blog where he says this. The whale is certainly one of the more out there teachings in Islam, even when discussing the other cosmological explanations that Islam tries to give about unknown aspects of the universe. Research into other similar claims of the unseen has shown that in many instances, Islam took from previous source material. So does the whale fit into this category? Well, there is a passage in Jewish literature which speaks of a great leviathan that has the earth laying upon it. It is the Apocalypse of Abraham, which is said to have been composed between 70 to 150 AD. Blackjack is alleging something you've seen dozens of times on this channel. Muslim authorities borrowing again. This is where we're going to pick up in this video. I want to give you background and context for understanding this stuff in the Jewish sources. After that, we'll be able to compare that to what we see in the Islamic sources, and then we can possibly draw some conclusions. But there's a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to try to do that as comprehensively and briefly as possible. So first, a word about myth. When I use the word myth in the following discussion, I'm using the word in an academic sense where, yes, there are many meanings given for this much-debated term, but I'm using myth to refer to a literary technique which ascribes cosmic significance to something mundane. The use of the word myth does not mean fairy tale or fiction. It means something that has meaning far beyond itself. 
So many of you are aware of Leviathan in the Old Testament. In different places this term is used, scholars have suggested a concrete referent would be something like a giant sea creature or somewhere else, maybe a crocodile. That specific question does not matter. The concrete referent of Leviathan is not our concern, but the mythological side is. And the mythological Leviathan refers to forces of chaos that oppose God's created order. This myth, again using the definition I just gave you, is developed several ways in Jewish sources. And this is where things get really interesting. Let's look at the first example you've already seen on this channel. Muhammad's prophethood was tested by posing these questions to him. Supposedly, only a prophet would know the answer, but as we've noted in a previous video, the answers to the first two questions are very widely circulated tropes, and Muhammad's answer to the third question is based on demonstrably wrong, borrowed ideas from ancient Greek medicine. The fact that this hadith is preserved as a testament to Muhammad's prophethood is an absolute joke. Another embarrassing hadith. Better call it weak, Muslims. But it's the second question and answer that I want to remind you of. What will be the first meal taken by the people of paradise? Muhammad's answer to this question is fish, similar to what we've seen in Jewish sources, where Leviathan surfaces again in the final eschatological battle where he will be slayed, eventually becoming food for the righteous, as these texts show. In the Talmud, which contains traditions the author of the Quran demonstrably borrowed from, Leviathan is being preserved in salt for the world to come. So this is one way the Leviathan myth developed. Let's call it the eschatological feast motif. Ultimately, Leviathan, which signifies chaos, disorder, and death, will be defeated and will be served as food in an eschatological banquet. Slightly gory, perhaps, but still very interesting. But think for a second. If that's what happens to Leviathan in the end, what is happening to Leviathan now? The answer to that question is the second way this myth was developed. We can call it the axis mundi because it relates to the connection between heaven and earth. As an introduction to this concept, let's look at a few texts. Note first that Leviathan is presently subdued. In the Apocalypse of Abraham, an angel tells Abraham that the angel is appointed to hold the Leviathans because through me is subjugated the attack and menace of every reptile. You might be recalling those reports attributed to Muhammad at the beginning of the video, which also closely associated Leviathan with an angel. Just a coincidence. But that's the answer to what is happening to Leviathan now. Chaos is presently kept at bay. That Leviathan is subdued is even indicated by his location. Later on in the apocalypse, Abraham is looking down on the earth from heaven and says, And I saw there the sea and its islands and its cattle and its fish and Leviathan and his realm and his bed and his lairs and the world which lay upon him. The world on the back of this giant sea monster is something we see in many other places in Jewish texts, and the myth persists. For example, much later, around the 8th to 10th century, in a Jewish midrash called The Greater Order of Creation, or The Work of Creation, we read, And that pillar and the whole world stand upon a single fin of Leviathan. Leviathan lies in the midst of the lower waters, like a small fish in the midst of the waters. In the 12th century, Ibn Ezra cites an earlier midrash that connects Leviathan to creation, using characteristically creative rabbinic hermeneutics. Linking the key word beginning between Job and Genesis, Leviathan was the beginning of God's creation, and the world was built upon him. In his commentary on Isaiah 27.1, Ibn Ezra refers to Leviathan by noting a Hebrew word associated with the axis mundi motif, and then proceeds to say that Leviathan stretches from one end to the other. The relatively late dates of these latter sources show the persistence of this myth across a large span of time. Of course, there are many parallels to the previously cited Islamic sources, some of which are roughly contemporaneous. We simply don't have time to investigate all of these. But clearly, this is all a variation on the same motif that places Leviathan in the lower parts of creation. So why these bizarre myths? Well, recall what I said earlier. We know what happens to Leviathan in the end. That's the eschatological banquet motif. Chaos that threatens life will be conquered and consumed. But what's happening to Leviathan now? That gap is filled by the Axis Monday myth and variations of it. So what this myth communicates is that chaos is presently subdued and relegated by God to the lowest parts of creation. God's above creation in the heavens. Forces that oppose him are allowed to exist, but those forces are subdued in the lowest parts of creation. So God's the divine conquering warrior. 
who overpower the sea monster. So this Leviathan mythology communicates that now chaos is subdued, but that's a prelude to the final conquering of chaos in the eschaton. The way these motifs are developed in the Hebrew Bible through Second Temple and rabbinic literature is absolutely fascinating. And those who want to continue this study between rabbinic and Arab sources will want to check out the Book of the Wonders of India. That's a 10th century Arabic work that bears striking resemblances to the Leviathan myth specifically as we find it in the Talmud. But at this point, you have enough context to understand the Leviathan myth. So we'll stop there. Now, go back to the beginning of this video in your mind. You know about this Leviathan myth. You know that the Jewish authors were trying to communicate this chaos stuff. And then you come to the Islamic sources. You'll notice that the problem appears to be that Muslim authorities were not aware of the mythological meanings. And Muslim sources, the whole earth on the back of the whale thing seems to be what they believed as a concrete description of reality. As we've seen, the prophet said the earth is on water and the water's on a rock and the rock is on a whale and it's a really big whale and the whale is on an angel. And again, Muhammad said the distance between two earths is a march of 500 years. They're on the back of a whale who's really big. And Ibn Abbas delights us once again. The earth is on noon, the noon is on the sea, the sea is on a rock, the rock is on the horn of a bull, and that bull is on the soil, and no one knows what is under the soil except Allah. Armed with this background knowledge, I encourage you to read through Blackjack's blog post. Is what these Muslim authorities say mythological or myth? Even attempting a charitable reading of these Islamic texts leads me to the same conclusion. Many very important voices in Islamic history believed the earth was riding on the back of a whale. It's as if they borrowed from their Jewish predecessors without understanding the cosmic significance of what those authors were trying to communicate. At least, they give no hint that they did. But decide for yourselves and let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.